The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, at the sight of the crowds, Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Then he summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. James, the sons of Zebedee and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon from Cana and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus sent out these twelve after instructing them thus, Do not go into pagan territory or enter a Samaritan's house. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Without cost, you are, you have received. Without cost, you are to give. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, first of all, to my brothers, happy Father's Day. It's always good, especially as biological fathers and our own, myself, as your spiritual father. It's nice that we have a day that the country honors. It's not as big as Mother's Day, though, uh, but rightly so. We love our mothers, but I'm glad we have a day. And it's always amazing how the secular calendar of our nation beautifully coincides with the liturgical church's calendar, and especially these readings, because I think it highlights a huge question for us, especially as men, if I can address my brothers for a second. So the heart of my homily, in fact, is towards you and towards myself. As we honor fathers, the question becomes... What makes for a good father? Isn't that an amazing question? What makes for a successful, honorable, virtuous father? It's a fantastic question, especially as men, because I think, especially for us, none of us want to be losers. None of us has ever woken up and said, you know what, I want to be a bad father. I want to be a loser father. I want to be a deadbeat father, or especially as a priest. You know what, I want to be a horrible priest. None of us say that. In fact, I think something within us is intertwined. Like, I want to be a great man, an honorable man. Because it's wired in our bones. So the question now becomes, well, what does it take? To be a good father. And these readings reveal to us how. In the book of Exodus, the great story of God talking to Moses. And there's a strange phrase here. So here they are, here the the Israelite people, they've been freed out of Egypt. And then Moses goes up the mountain and he's talking to God. 
And he says this, and we heard this in that first reading. He says, Go tell the Israelites how I bore you up on eagles' wings and I brought you here to myself. So he's telling the Israelite people, I've chosen you out of all the different people of the world, not because you're amazing, but because you're, you're small and I chose you for a very specific task. And he says, you shall be my people. If you hearken to my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my special possession. And then this phrase here, you shall be a kingdom of priests. Kingdom of priests. In the original Hebrew is Mekayif Kohanim. Mokahith Kohanim. That's a very specific phrase there, and it would have meant the world to the Israelite people to hear that phrase. Because that phrase, kingdom of priests, or other translations say, a royal priesthood. So God is telling the Israelite people, you, the chosen people, are called to be a royal priesthood. What the heck does that mean? Because that phrase can only be understood in light of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, of course, is the story of creation. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God creates Adam, the first father. Now here's a clue to the original question we began with. What does it make to be a good father? Well, our designer, our architect, our creator, gives Adam, the first father, his twofold duty. And you see this, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He creates Adam, he says, Adam, I got a job for you. And then men, brothers, when you hear this phrase, apply it to, one, to your own life. Adam, you are tasked to till and to keep the Garden of Eden. Till and to keep. Another translation, to work and protect. Now, we hear those two words, especially as men, we immediately nod our heads. Oh, because as men, we love to work, even sometimes to the complaint of our, our, our beloved, aren't they? Isn't that true? What is one of the complaints you women have about us men? We work too much, right? It's a constant, it's a constant battle. Well, that's intertwined and hardwired in us. We're called to work. And then, as men, and we should be nodding our heads immediately, we are called to protect. Oh, you want to fire up a young man? You, you, you use battle language. Why the vast majority of soldiers throughout human history have always been men, and rightly so, because it's hardwired within us. And there's a reason why we're bigger, faster, and stronger. We're hardwired to protect. Till and to keep, in Hebrew, Chabad and Shamar. So to be a good father, we are called to work in service for and to protect the garden and our families. Right there. The measure, the plan for us men. And insofar as our lives align with that twofold task of Abad and Shamar, I dare say, as men, we will be more fulfilled and have a sense of profound purpose in our lives. But what happened to Adam? Genesis chapter 3 tells us what happened is the story of the fall. And we know the story of the fall well. When you read Genesis chapter 3, there's something inherent in it. Because sometimes when you read Genesis chapter 3, people oftentimes, they blame Eve. Well, Eve gave me the fruit. 
Remember that story? That, in fact, that was Adam's first complaint. God, the woman whom you gave me, gave me the fruit. The blame game. <laughs> well, we always love the blame game, don't we? It's hardwired in us. It was your fault, God. You, you did this. And, but then the question is, is in fact Adam's first mistake. How did the serpent get in the garden to begin with? It's not Eve's fault that the serpent was there. It was Adam's fault for allowing the serpent in. He had failed in the second shamar to guard and protect Eden. He allowed the snakes in. And so sadly, what Adam does when he rebels against God in Genesis chapter 3 and then this, and then this fall of, of humanity ushers forth, Adam was a bad father. But here's the great and lasting beauty of all of our readings today. Because when God speaks to Moses here and he's telling the Israelite people, you are called to be a kingdom of priests, what essentially, what, what they heard here is that I'm going to give back to you what Adam lost. Because that language of kingdom of priests was a role that Adam was supposed to play. But he was a bad father, and so he messed it all up. But then God said to the Israelite people, no, I'm going to restore this back to you. You're going to receive what Adam had lost, which was original plan, to this kingdom of priests, this machaif kohanim, to come to restore it now. So listen to that. The beginning of the Jewish people are called to be a kingdom of priests, are called to be a new Adam. God was giving us another chance. And now, with all of that, look at the final fulfillment here in the gospel. Jesus now comes down, of course, God in the flesh. And he says to them, as he's looking around, notice this. Now, Jesus is the perfect example of what it means to be a man. The perfect example. Perfect. Jesus is now looking at the crowd, and his heart is moved with pity for them. Because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. So notice this. Here's Jesus, the perfect man. He's looking out, just as a father should, and he's seeing his children, and they're in pain, and they're suffering. And so as, as men, fathers, when we see our children in pain and suffering, what do we do? Do we abandon them? Do we turn the other way? Like Adam did? No. Men, again, what's intertwined? What is hardwired within us? I will go to my children. I will go to them and I will pick them up. And that's precisely what our Lord does. And again, giving us the example. Look what he says. He says, look, my children, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. And then... Now, Jesus begins to go about to build a Chabad. Remember, the first task of Adam. Look at what happens next. He begins to build and he takes the 12 apostles. And beautifully, the names are given to us here. The 12 apostles will be the first priests. The first fathers of the new covenant. And he lays out their names. Father Peter, Father Andrew, Father James, Father John, Father Philip, Father Bartholomew, Father Thomas, Father Matthew, Father Thaddeus, Father James, and Father Judas. We all know Judas made a mistake. What mistake did Judas, Father Judas, do? He thought of himself. The constant mistake of us fathers, us priests. Because Judas was not 
acting the twofold task of Adam, of the Abad and the Shamar. What was Judas building up? Himself. Who was Judas protecting? His bank account. Do you see why Judas is a horrible father? And then notice next. As he sends out the twelve into the world, he says, now look at the, the, the twofold action of, of, of the apostles, the role when they go out into the world. They're curing the sick, they're raising the dead, they're cleansing lepers, and they're driving out demons. What are they doing? They are fighting, protecting, and serving the church, the family of God now. And here is that last line, my brothers. And I'll hear this, because when I'm preaching these words, I'm sensing you that some of you may feel in deep shame. Why? Because we are all weak. And we've all made mistakes. We have not lived to the lofty standard of what God created us men to be. Do not be discouraged. Do not fall into despair. You see, the beauty of our Christian faith is that no matter how many times we mess up as our role as fathers, God will always take us back, restore us, and to strengthen us to live our vocation. Because at the last line of the gospel, what does he say? Without cost, you have received. Without cost, you are to give. That last line is the guiding principle for us men. When I hear that line, I don't know, but I hear a challenge. Especially when I'm lazy and I'm tired and I don't want to do anything and I just want to lay on the couch and do nothing. You know what I hear? I hear the Lord saying, No, Father Sullivan, without cost you are to receive, without cost you are to give. And so you too now, my brothers, my fathers, fathers of your own families, fathers of the church here, there is our task. We are called to give without counting the cost, to undo the mistake of Adam, and to follow now the restored new Adam, Jesus Christ. And if we need a reminder of how that looks, just make the sign of the cross. Because look what our Lord does upon that. He gave without any sense of worry about himself. He poured out his last drop of blood. What does it mean to be a good father? It's right there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.